Welcome to Reader Syndicate 3.0, the next evolution of the look into counterculture that is canon. My name is Matthew, owner of Riot Seeds, and this started as a one-man mission for strain history and breeding science. Over time, it's evolved into something bigger, better, and more of a team effort. We will be joined by members of the Can Illuminati and other friends throughout the seasons to hear their takes on grow techniques, breeding science, strain history, and more. Our mission is to combat the narrative that corporate cannabis and seed posers are obfuscating for their own financial benefit. Welcome to the underground. We are the Syndicate. Hey everyone, I just wanted to take a quick moment before we enter into this uh, awesome, awesome episode with more members from the Canada Command. I let you know our Blue Revolution is in stock. The Blueberry Ink Cross that we've been working on for five years now is finally at its, uh, what I feel is a great completion point for it. Uh, a true breeding line for blueberry scents and flavor. Um, it was our most popular selling line on the original release when we released the first Blue Bonnet Crosses. I didn't make a whole lot of them because I really wanted to explore what was in them before I did a major release. Uh, we were at that point. And it was uh, originally a DJ Short Blueberry from DJ Short's early, early work where he would sell the seeds at different talks that he would do across California at collectives. Uh, Buddy Resinlung picked up some packs. He gave them to me. I went through them and found the best representative of what I thought the most beautiful blueberry was like. But it didn't have the exact scent that I wanted when I saw that. In my mind's eye, and I was as I would look at it, I would picture beautiful blueberry jam, terps, and flavor and scent, just all of it. And they didn't have it. So we made a mission the last five years to make this a reality and something where you could pop a pack of seeds and it would be almost identical for that terp profile. We're there. They are now released on riotseeds.com. The pre order's over, they're already shipping out. We also have something called the Modern Blue um, that we didn't really release. We did it on our uh, Patreon, so definitely check that out. Our 50-tier Patreon ended up getting the lion's share of these with their monthly package. And it was the Mac Daddy cross to Blueberry in cross Mac Daddy from a company called Outhouse Genetics. And then my personal favorite out of the uh, hype strains as it were, that we are kind of uh, merging with some of this blue stuff so that we can bring it into the modern generation and get some of the new kids interested. The Sherb Cream Pie, phenomenally resinous, great hash maker, great yielding, nice long high for a Sherb cross, which is my biggest problem with Sherb, cross to our Blueberry Inn cross, and we call that one Blue Cocky. And um, yeah, triple entendre there. Uh, we have blues for me because it's blast for me to use something like runts for me, but the white runts out of all the runt stuff, I found to be the best runts cross with the most potent high. We did a blueberry in cross cross to that bringing heavy, heavy blueberry jam terps to the white runts. And we also have trop berry, which is the dosi trop, uh, tropic trop cherry, I believe cross to the dosi dose cross to the blueberry in cross. All of these are currently available on our site. Um, when they're sold out, they're sold out and that's it. Um, wanted to make sure you're all aware of that. And without any further ado, let's get into our show and welcome curbside and some of his homies from the command. Welcome to breeder syndicate. I'm Matthew. And today I'm here, not with my co-host. He's uh, busy doing work. So today I'm going to be the one hosting it. And we have some of the other crew from the Canna Cabana. We got Oki. We got Chris Vaus. Is that how you say it? Yes, sir. And Kirby, the man behind the new version of Canna Cabana. And today we're going to talk with each one of these guys about how they got into everything, um, what their specialties are, what they've done with it, uh, the different areas they've traveled. And not only that, but the future for the Canna Cabana, because you know, we really want to instill from, from the Breeders Syndicate side how important forum culture was and is and will always be to keeping, like, everything correct, straight, 
and keeping that part of the culture alive because that's that was been a major part of the culture for all of us. So with that, um, Oki, you want to start? Tell us about yourself, brother. How did you get started? Uh, yeah, I got started in the uh, uh, weed biz by uh, pretty much not having any access to, to good weed in Oklahoma. I was tired of uh, kind of the, the Mexican brick that I was used to getting, and I yeah. kind of figured, hey, I might be able to grow better than this. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that's where I got started back in um, – uh, 2002 in Oklahoma, uh, in my closet. And, uh, after that, you know, we moved to Denver, which is where all of us met and, uh, you know, kind of, uh, gradually scaled things up over time. Where did you get your seeds from early on when you, uh, or your, your first genetics? Man, you know, I think it was, do you remember, it was like, uh, Heaven's Gateway or something. Oh, Heaven's like Stairway? That. Yeah, yeah, Heaven's, yeah. Yeah, that one. Um, I got some, um, the first, the first seeds I ever grew were, I'm pretty sure it was, uh, Brothers Grimm C99, and then nice. it was a, uh, G13, uh, uh, hash plant cross, and, um, Real nice. I mean, I was a shitty grower at the time, so it wasn't that good, but, uh, you know. It was a nice place to start. Yeah, dude. I mean, it's like a, di a different look from the Mexican brickweed, obviously. I grew up on the same. Like, I was a de definite meth <laughs> Mexican brickweed smoker, you know, growing up. And uh, I appreciated it for what it was until I found real dank and really quickly realized there's a whole – this is a whole nother level of weed, bro. So, yeah, totally. I appreciate that. How about you, Chris? Tell us some of uh, your early beginnings. Yeah, I, I grew up in Florida um pretty much similar story to uh to oki you know started growing in my closet when i was in college uh started smoking when i was like maybe 12 or 13 kind of on yep. the regular by, by late high school you know um and in college i actually found myself like you know i went to a big florida college like everyone partying and i just couldn't like hang and drink like bothered my stomach mm -hmm. and i soon i soon figured out that like cannabis was my social in it was my way to talk to girls and my way to hang out with people and you know because i couldn't hang on like pounding beers night after night yeah, yeah. so um so it kind of just became my thing i started selling weed i started growing weed and um you know i met some good people early on that that got to put me on got you know guys that had a bunch of grow houses going and just put me to work as like a as a grunt basically and you know, we just had the old speed trays with the Rockwell slabs and, you know, this was like early, early, mid 2000s, you know, similar timeline, 2003, 2005. And, uh, and, you know, had a couple spots, eventually got my own little spot going, cranking out. And, uh, and then we all got raided <laughs> no. and, uh, and then ended up laying low for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, spent a lot of time in Amsterdam, going to Europe a lot. And, uh, you know, and then went to California in 2009, was in Oakland, ended up getting like robbed and just everything fell apart. It was just like an Oakland story, you know, it was yeah. just 2009 when things were just Oakland's opening. Rough, bro. Yeah. And I had a cousin in Denver and I was like, you know, Colorado's not that bad. And they're like legalizing like Cali is. So I just went there and like kind of started life over in his basement and he let me kind of run his grow and uh you know within less than a year of being in colorado i had a, a an investor a warehouse a spot you know just kind of yeah. just just in it and meeting people and uh, you know it was a good thing so what were some of the early strains you saw when you were first barely starting to grow um the guys that i got put on with just were growing this hash plant this florida hash plant that you know, I've heard the guys from Swamp Boys, a couple of people that were in that scene in that day talk about, yeah. um, I, you know, some people said it came from the Sensi Seeds hash plant from Amsterdam, but nobody was really sure. Yeah. Um, some people, some people say it may have been the white before we called it that. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. cause it had that, you know, squatty, um, it was real hashy smelling like that mirror scene kind of really cut through. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was it was just about pumping that one plant out, and it was super dank. But I, I feel like like I never saw anything like that again. I think that cut just disappeared. Like everybody got busted, and it just didn't make it. You know? Yeah, Florida had some dank, bro. Florida had all kinds of dank over there, running around in different little uh, circles. 
pretty yeah. wild. Yeah, it was a big indoor scene up until 2006 when the, you know, there was federal funding to like get everybody busted. But they they said there was more indoor in Florida than in California. I believe it. Yeah, I, yeah, they held down like you know the Triangle Kush, the white, like you said, the Gainesville Green. There's all kinds of stuff that came out of there that was just absolute fire and and changed the world of cannabis as far as I see it. Yep. Okay, Kirby, curbside. Let's see, uh, probably like mid to late 90s, I started smoking weed, swag weed that I was stealing from my dad. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, so, and he uh, he didn't have the highest of standards for himself, so it wasn't very good. For sure, yeah. And uh, But then I, I had a buddy, um, real good friend of mine, who had went to Amsterdam and he came back with some seeds. I believe they were uh, some Neville's Northern Lights number five. And, oh, nice. Uh, he grew that and we smoked that for years. We called it Cleese Brand. And mm-hmm. uh, that was kind of <clears> like <throat> he, he was the first dude uh, of our, of my friends that was growing weed, had, um, you know, did it from seed, all of that. And uh, I had state, another buddy. Really? I had another buddy who was a big smoker who had a hippie friend who always had like the fire, like the best weed that we had seen at the time. And uh, he had some strawberry cough one time. I remember Yuck Mouth from the Loonies was in town and we got this ounce that we were going to go sell to Yuck Mouth. And uh, he looked at it. It was like the best weed we had ever seen too. We were all just like, oh, we shouldn't even sell this to him. And then he takes one look at it. And he's like, oh, this is some fruity shit. Oh, I want this. And like, talk oh, no. uh, And we were all just like, what the? We were just like crying over here, trying to figure out how we can get this weed back from him. Yeah, right. Um, but uh, yeah, so we just started smoking. He was, you know, I started learning how to grow a little bit of weed from him. I was always, you know, hustling some weed on the side. And uh Early on, my favorite, uh, I mean, back in the day when I think of like early 2000s weed, and it's still, I've, I've talked about it several times, favorite weed all time, cat piss. It would stay yeah. in your pipe. It would, you know, you'd, you'd be smoking something different, and three weeks later, and the resin in your pipe would still taste like cat piss. And, oh, that's uh, wild. It was just so yeah. pungent and um, What area of the memorable. country were you living in? I was in Denver, Aurora. Oh, you were in, were you born and raised there? Born and raised, Aurora, Colorado. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Right, I didn't know that part. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, early on. Uh, right when Chris kind of moved out there, it was probably around 2009. Shortly mm-hmm. after he got out there, we linked up. Um, online somehow i can't even tell you specifically how it happened yeah i ended up working with chris in his first warehouse that he even had up there in uh boulder it was uh behind a strip club called the bus stop and uh, (laughs) it uh there was always some entertainment provided and i'm uh, sure standing out smoking your joint outside of work you know uh, uh, (laughs) so yeah and uh just you know, Chris, he's so good at uh, networking and meeting people, and he travels around all the time. Like, so many people that I've met and become friends with or, you know, mutual acquaintances with is from Chris traveling around, meeting everybody. And one of the best introductions that you could make, you know, back in the day in the weed game was like, oh, I'm such and such from the cabana. And oh, it was yeah, almost yeah. like, you know the locks on the doors just opened up and it was like, you were almost already kind of verified. And uh, so you already had the cabana stamp of approval. So a lot of people were more open to uh, meeting you and, you know, talking to you and working with you and stuff. So that's how uh, it started early on. Yeah, dude. I remember, you know, I think me and you first met, I don't remember who it was through, maybe Phil. Phil Rojo, but I yeah. remember we first met at a strip club, uh, uh, Shotgun Willie's. Every 420 back in the day, 
uh, Canarado would throw yeah. a big um, event at Shotgun Willie's, and can't remember what it was. He had some kind of loose connection to Shotgun Willie's. So, yeah, like, just a few loose connections there. Yeah, yeah so, somewhere uh, they allowed all of us to go in there and run rampant for the day. But yeah, the, there were uh, a couple of really good years where we had a lot yeah, of dude. people. Uh, I remember the stacks of two dollar bills, bro. Stacks of twos yeah. from Kirby. <laughs> oh, <laughs> if you were there for the two dollar bill year, you were there for a good year. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. I was there the year. I don't know if you remember this. Me and Joe Schmo decided we were going to start smoking inside Shotgun Willie's, and the cops fucking pushed us all the way into the back. And we're kind of surrounding us slowly but surely because they weren't quite sure if we we're going to fucking fight and what we we're going to do. And all of a sudden, like a hooker backed, backed her Lamborghini up over a cop car. And that was it, dude. Like they all bailed out the front and we were able to fucking scurry on out. <laughs> we tested time. them boundaries, bro. <laughs> and uh, it's just crazy because like events like that, man, just the six degrees of separation <clears throat> that so many of us have. Oh, yeah, and, uh, dude. You know. What, it, what what do you call it? The Kevin Bacon theory or however it yeah, works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, For sure. And uh we and out in Colorado, man, it was cool because there were several uh um <laughs> I got I might have a special guest for us later, man. We just mentioned his name. He actually just texted me here. So uh, who? Let's see, Rado? Him, let's see if we can get Rojo on here, man. Oh my god, that would be killer, dude. Yeah. That would be killer. Um, I missed him. Where was I at? I lost my train of thought there. Uh, just, you know, seven degrees of separation, Kevin Bacon, how we all kind of went through there. and Oh, yeah. Out in Colorado, there was kind of like, you know, we all knew each other. We all had gone to, you know, Motive, uh, Motive 303. He yep, used to throw motive. a bunch of uh, great dude barbecues and gatherings at his house. So we'd go over to Motive's. I would do some at my house. We'd come over to mine. Uh, we'd go to Skitty's house. We'd go to Bobby O's house. We'd be at uh, Howie's, of course. That was kind of like the yeah. um, the home base, I guess you would say. And uh, but you know, th there were people that hung out with you know Cobb and Paco and Rojo. Those guys kind of always hung out, you know, with themselves. Yeah. And then Motive, and you know, I, I might be getting, you know getting things wrong and who hung out with who, but everybody had their own little clicks. And, Did you mention uh, Rojo? Well, yeah, Rojo and Paco and Cobb. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. Because um, they all, all used to work together, I think, um, at a spot down here in Denver. There was also the Adam Dunn Cannabis Cup events. You remember those? Yes. At all? Yeah, when yeah. they started doing those. Me and Mitch originally had planned those out for an event we were going to do called the Breeders' Ball. And it suddenly uh -huh. got like co opted into Adam Dunn's kind of gig, but those are kind of fun too. Cause like you'd have breeders that fucking wanted to kill each other at those events, and we would all just kind of put all our, our weapons down as we came in the fucking event and smoked and fraternized. There, there was a period in time with the events, probably it's, it's probably 10 years ago now, where it's like 10 years ago, I'd say was like the height of cannabis events, and then. Yep. Then they started kind of getting flooded, and uh, there was too many of them, and they were too expensive, and yeah. all of that. They kind of drowned themselves out, and then COVID came, and you know nobody wanted to hang out with anybody. Exactly and right. Yeah. It's still uh, it's still recovering now. I think as far as like a smoking cannabis scene, and it's it's a little different. I mean, a lot of people are you know still you know, just sit down and blaze with anybody, but I don't want to go to a cup and just smoke everybody's weed anymore. I've, I've no. done that and I've for had sure. cup cough. I don't want to, you know. Yeah, we, we have events um, for our group, like me, CSI, Bodie, a bunch of us out here in California, and I'd love to get you guys all to come out for it. Um, if possible, I know it's a, you know, hell of a trip, but we do it out in the, last time we did it out by Yosemite, rented a big ass mansion crash for a few days and just smoke tons of different kinds of weed from everyone and it's you won't have to twist kind of my in, arm very hard man yeah i know it was it was in the like i really took it from like the nugs and jugs events the shit canarado did and even some of the adam dunn stuff like it was all inspiring to me to be like i think we can pull this shit off where even if people don't necessarily get along 
we can get along for three days smoking weed and talking weed and being fucking nerds for a little bit. And it's yeah. it's been fucking insane. One year we had like you know Josh D, all the Triangle guys come out, the Irene crew came out. It was pretty phenomenal. So this next round, I really would love to have some of you guys come out. I learned from the events that uh, the booth is like the magic spot. You know, if yep. you have the booth where, you know, and when I was working with the Lazy Lion, we would always go out of our way to have one of the biggest booths and to yeah. have extra space so people could hang out and to have that social aspect of it. And I would always tell all these breeders, like, you don't need a booth. You can come set up at my at my booth yep. and uh, sell seeds, make money. You know, we can combine the traffic of everybody over there and it, it, it worked real well for a long time and everybody was always welcome. And we made, I made some great friends that way yeah, dude. Um, and met a ton of people and acquired a ton of seeds, gave a ton of seeds away. You know? <laughs> so uh, it, it was good times back in the day. And I, I hope uh, the industry can get back to there at some point. There has to, we got to kind of level out at some point. I think I think like what we're trying to do with the show too is to bring back some of that culture, um, teach some of the younger dudes that this shit did exist, d does exist, can exist, and that there there is something deeper than just like trying to strain hunt the newest cookies and flashing your and flexing your shit on Instagram like you're some big baller. Like there's a lot yeah. more culture involved in that, and like love and brotherhood, yeah, you know, very deep that lasts last decades and span decades. You know that they can become a part of and be involved in if they're good people. The newer generation too, I think uh, they're spoiled in the sense that uh, we gave them so much stuff that they didn't have to work for it all. Yeah. You no, know? Very true. <laughs> it's very just, fucking true. You know, these events, like they were kind of taboo for a while there. And it's like, people were scared to go to cannabis cups like sure. early on because it's like, they didn't even want to be associated with them or, seen yeah. at them or something and just the the whole shift of how how it's changed over the years and the dynamic of how people approach them and how they're utilized and stuff is uh it's interesting to see you know i miss i miss how emerald cup was out here because we get a lot of you guys out here for emerald cup and like getting to see guys like rado you know you guys and, and interacting and it, it was super fucking cool because we don't living across the country we don't get to see each other too often and, and a lot of that culture has been lost with the emerald cup how corporate it's gone not a lot i was just of the gonna say emerald needs. cup used to be kind of the the thing that everybody was it was looked at as kind of like the equilibrium where it was fair yeah. playing ground and the best of the best was gonna go there and then it turned into sponsorship dollars and yeah and seed uh, companies would make like their their money for the year there dude like that's yeah. You make a chunk there and that and uh, it would feed a lot of people i've seen uh I've, I've been at the booth you know yeah with, right with, with people and seen uh well into the six figures come in over over yeah, oh, a weekend yeah. for sure oh, yeah. you know those weekends i don't know how many of them there are these days but back uh, in the day there were some good weekends yeah dude there's, there really isn't any more i mean like um if you're not like a registered licensed company you're not getting in and that's just that. So and a lot of people of us just don't give a fuck about that <laughs> part of it, you know. Not me, of course. I'm totally legal and uh, <laughs> follow every law. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I thought I thought Emerald Cup probably peaked in like 2016, yep. and then after that, it just kind of got like, you know, more more just corporatized and more about the business than than actually an event for growers um because it was always good going out there because like as a grower you know you, yeah you can go to all these other cups and you know high times cannabis cup or whatever was going on but you didn't really have access to like the genetics and what was really happening but you know emerald cup whatever i go see a doctor for five minutes right there in line to get in and he checks my arm and then i'm going in the back medical area and you know, and I get to like talk to the breeders and they have jars yeah. of the flower and I can open it, touch it, smell it before I buy the seeds. Like you couldn't do that online. You couldn't do that anywhere. 
you yeah. know so as a, as a grower it was the number one event because like you could touch and feel the genetics before you grow it that's so that's a that was a game changer and when they got rid of that i was like there's no point in going anymore yeah that's the way i felt i stopped participating myself everyone always used to bring their special drops to the yes. emerald cup too like you know their big crosses and their big drops and, exclusive uh, drops bro i mean i used to my my emerald cup budget was blown every year and far exceeded <laughs> on uh uh beans and stuff that i would come back with and then people were always gifting you know coming to the booth and dropping stuff off and things like oh, that yeah. and uh just so many the genetics uh that the emerald cup provided man I, hands down the best event i would absolutely. say absolutely there were some good can high times cannabis cups in you know Denver and I was out there the first year for that and it, it was pretty decent first year for the Denver one yeah the very first Denver cannabis cup yeah it was those ones were good I think uh, I can't remember if uh, if that was the year I brought Cornbread Ricky out it was the but, year Karma actually won the cup okay yeah his very first cup and it was like fuck one of the, at the time i thought one of the good guys won but he ended up snitching on me so karma snitching. did oh yeah uh oh sure fucking did yeah <laughs> See, love me. Mouth, right? yeah right <laughs> too bad. That's, um, how it goes. that's the other hard part man is uh you know everybody has their list of people that they don't fuck with man and, yeah uh, whereas with the, the cabana guys. i've been trying to make it a place where everybody can you know be friends with everybody and yeah uh, i've been i've been trying so hard to make that happen and I, I have encountered a couple of walls where it's like oh so and so this and so and so that i'm like bro grown man this is the internet ignore him like yeah yeah you know. it's not too fucking hard you know like even for me who's a very aggressive personality and like really have a hard time shutting my mouth like it's kind of nice to have the cabana and and like i've even dropped some beefs with people that i fucking hated since day one um you know people that trolled the first my first troll bro and we reached out to each other and just like dude how old are we now let's just fucking chill you know, yeah. it's been nice for that reason. And uh, and it's opened up a lot of bridges for me. But like some of us grow over the years and, and get used to that shit. Like even with the karma thing, like that was a big deal. But like at the same time, I'm past it. It's just whatever. You know? like, yeah. Well, there's always well, extenuating was, circumstances. That was one of the benefits I felt like of the cabana was that because you had to go through this invite process and they were more strict about, you know, starting shit that you didn't have just like trolls like i mean we were all on like ic mag and all these other yeah. sites before that you know and and you could just create another account create another email whatever go on there yeah, talk yeah, to yeah. you could talk shit about yourself as a way to hype yourself up as a seed brand because just to get drama started or whatever you absolutely know, do that yeah. you know but you couldn't none of that was flying on the cabana because no, like i got booted so you. many times bro <laughs> yeah and it was you and you had to like beg you know beg to get back on there yeah, like, dude. you know i'd have like long conversations like three four hours with with howie with the admins and like all right i'm sorry you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah there were zero tolerance policies and then there were cabana zero tolerance policies man and they yeah. took them to uh um another level back in the day but they were actually needed at the time they really and, were they really were and it offered, uh, it made the cabana a place that, uh, for, I mean, for so many reasons, but that one specifically made it different than the other places, man. Because if somebody got in there and mouthing off, like it, it was, it was deleted, it was reported, he was banned. Yeah, it was never an issue. You know? <clears throat> yeah. You know, and I never, I never held any hard feelings because I always knew it's like that's the old guard at the cabana, and they don't put up with that shit. So I never held any hard feelings. So I was like, yeah, I probably fucking went too far on that one. You know, like you always gotta know, you gotta self check a little bit. But they've always been, even after that though, they were always fucking cool to me. You know what I mean? So it's always been a, a place close to my heart. Uh, even with the cabana and me, you know, there was I, I did a lot of things that weren't exactly like. Uh, 
cabana friendly activities. Sure. So I wasn't on there actively for a long time, but I'd still be belly boating with Howie on the weekends and going fishing and at all the barbecues. And, you know, so I, I, I don't have many posts on the cabana. I, I was never yeah. like the most active guy on there. And, uh, but it's because I was working with seeds. Boom. I'm working with all these breeders. I'm doing all these things. I'm doing all these testers and boom, they don't like seeds. I'm, you know, yeah growing weed for this giant dab bar where it's like a smoke facility and yeah yeah you know we don't want to promote that to the to the crowd and yeah, so there's just things i was doing that uh weren't cabana friendly but i was still always around with the cabana and um you know skitty i give him a ton of props because to this day i still grow just my own version of skitty tech you know it's all yeah yeah essentially the same um kind of technique I, I switch up my nutrients and i've done things you know tons of different ways where skitty is pretty tried and true and he does not yes, he does. deviate yeah. from his script very often and uh still rocking it with tremendous success to this day and, uh, so. and Sk Skitty was the first dude that I met like years ago. This is like 2011, where he's like, "Yeah, I only got like 3.1 per light on this round. You know, I'm gonna do better next time." And it's like, only, you know, yeah. e everybody used to throw those numbers around on the forums, and we're like, "Yeah, bro, whatever forum." Yeah, numbers, right, right. right. And but like, I had the, you know, I'd see his garden, I'd see how meticulous he was in his canopy. And I even went there just to trim for him a couple of times and just to see what it was. And I'm like, bro, these really do weigh what he says they do. Yeah, you know? right. Like, like, wow. And, and, you know, he was, you know, like Curb said, there's a lot of just consistency there. And, um, you know, he, he, he just was like, he just had his method. And, uh, I mean, it was kind of like early crop steering before he knew what it was because he'd be watering them a couple of times a day by hand. You know, be like, oh, go back and, you know, yeah, skinny yeah. steering. There you go. You know, but yeah, sometimes he's hand water four times a day, you know. So um and, and we didn't understand that then. Like more water, more newts equals more yield, but like, really, like you know, like isn't it already wet? What does that matter? Yeah, so, right. <laughs> you know, but but yeah, he, he he really proved that because yeah, because I mean back in the day, like on the forums, everybody like said whatever you know it's hard yeah. to prove anybody's real yields and everyone's setups was were it was primitive you know so it's not like we had dehues on the ceiling and we're like we were just flat job and even 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 bigger bigger grows hundred lighters i mean we were using residential acs and like we didn't really know what we were doing then you know from an engineering like design standpoint at least so um so it was just cool to have that open sharing of knowledge but but like the, what was different for the cabana was just it was so genetic centered and yes. you know like like curb said at the beginning like you know it was all it's just like open the door like you know like the gatekeepers had finally opened the gates to like all the hoarded clone onlys of the time that you only read about that you know we're like we were like ah oh, it's finally my turn to be the cool kid you know <laughs> right and you could finally so. see pictures good grows of some of these things that you'd only heard about and, and, you know, I mean, when you'd look on IC Mag, you'd see people growing it and it'd be like nine obviously different plants that weren't related. But finally on the cabana, you could see legit shit being grown. And that was something special, I think. And, uh, sure. and, and it's and it's one of the things I'm telling people now, like, why should you visit the cabana? Because you can finally see that shit. You can finally go look and see all that stuff. It's there. You know, like this is this is important historical documentation. I do encourage people to dig through these forums, man, and look through some of these old posts and you will be shocked at who you see chiming in and discussing things. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Like back in the day when it was like, uh, you know, ghost OG was the hot thing. It's like, I knew we had the real ghost because how we got the ghost from ghost. Yeah. You yeah. Know what I mean, and it was like, uh, there was never any question about it and the authenticity of clones when people really started like 
trading genetics, it was a blessing and a curse at the same time because mm-hmm. you got the people who got the real genetics and mm-hmm. we'll share them and get them out to people. And then you got other people who will take any old thing and just say, oh, this is SFV. Oh, yeah, the bullshit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when you're somebody trapping out a 10 lighter or a 20 lighter or, and th- that's your main thing, you got your whole garden riding on this riding on this SFV OG clone or yeah. whatever it may be. And then it's, it's some boof shit. That's some skunk you know, one. not yeah. the real thing. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, even if it's good, but it's not SFV, it's like, you know, that was the hard part was confirming things, but the cabana, everything was like already confirmed. I see mag THC farmer. Everything came like with a level of skepticism. God, there's so much know? fucking shenanigans <laughs> on those places, bro. I can't even, there's not a lot good I can say about those places, to be honest. I mean, granted, I love Estes all those finest. places, and I encourage everybody, man. I want every back in the day, I was on THC Farmer, IC Mag, um, roll man, it up, uh, troll it up. I was, I was never on roll it up, yeah. but uh. Ivan from Jungle Boys had his own little forum like there yeah, for a minute. Yeah. I can't even remember what it was called right now. Uh, Can a collective, I think. Um, oh God, yeah. That, that, that was, was maybe, that, that might have been a seed bank. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, that was pre- that was the uh, after that that forum Pot Pimp went down. It became Can a Collective. Do you remember Pot okay. Pimp? No? The yeah, UK I group. Oh fuck! What a dumbass there, name for a forum. Bro. There was another one that like um like Cornbread and a couple guys were on. That was uh, a bunch of Cali guys were running it, like Sway and those guys from yeah. like Sacramento. Um, and everybody would always be in the chat room. What was the name of that site? I can't remember. It was another one. I don't know. I wasn't invited. Like, it was like trying to be like the Cabana, but it never really took off. Other than the chat room, and the chat room was just people like late at night talking shit while their res was filling up basically yeah you know like <laughs> i was always formally disinvited from these places bro like uh well be it ic mags i wouldn't sell my seeds there and then logic and the farm there's a actual like when you google matt riot the first thing that pops up is matt riot is a total douchebag on the farm like yeah, they love <laughs> they love my ass there <laughs> Yeah, that was a great man. There, there were actual like forum superstars back in the day and forum villains. Uh, yeah, I would definitely fit the villain mold. Yeah, you might have yeah. been a villain, man. I was definitely you know. a villain. <laughs> definitely yeah, you kind of guess it, like, uh, you know, whose troll account you're interacting with, you know, yeah, right? We we knew we knew uh, a few uh, pretty infamous trolls ourselves. Can do. <laughs> <laughs> we uh we have a buddy who he might he he could be up there in the uh, top trolls <laughs> which one <laughs> on the which forums one? in the game man but, which one? Uh, still, still too big i think was his name still uh, too big still too and, big uh, yeah he he's a, a real life troll and uh he's also one of the best dudes in the world he would give you a shirt off his back so as I, I trolls think- go he was our troll and, yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah, um, I think he disseminated more genetics that were supposed to have restrictions yeah. on them than anybody I yeah. ever met. He was just like, he was like, "What? I'm not supposed to give this to anybody? All right, I'm going to give yeah. it to like 50 people." Like, <laughs> you, don't, you, you, you don't give him a garden. cut with conditions. Forget it. Yeah, right. You know? you yeah. Something in your garden with conditions, like Ogie was saying, like don't even tell him because the second you tell him, like, "Oh, you can't have this one," that's the one he's taken. Like, yeah, for sure. Bathroom, he's gonna do whatever. He's gonna go down. God there. bless him. And then he's gonna come up the stairs and tell you, "Hey, I just stole that clown from there, man. I'm going home to root this up." <laughs> yeah, he'd have so. it in his ear, like a like a pencil <laughs> or a joint. He'd just have the oh, clown there. Great, and be like, dude. Peace out. <laughs> so, so I want to start getting into some of you dudes, like what your specialties are. Okie, what's your specialty? Like, where did you take cannabis? Where did you find your niche in this? uh wide world man um you know that that's a tough one to to answer um i think like if i do have a specialty it's just uh you know being able to uh put a concept together and you know get people excited about it and then you know follow through on the execution um 
you know, for, from a growing perspective, uh, uh, a lot of the stuff that we're working on now is all new to me, like the, the crop yeah. steering stuff, you know, all of the science associated with that. And, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're all, uh, uh, used to growing in the basement and then you know, yeah. I had a, a brief, uh, a bit of greenhouse growing experience, but, uh, yeah, no, the, the legal and, uh, commercial stuff is like fairly new to me. Yeah. And how's that been for you? Oh, it's good. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, there's uh, good and bad with it. I mean, I don't have to worry about anyone kicking in my door anymore, but, um, you know, going through, uh, testing, uh, sucks a lot. And, uh, you know, uh, dealing with metric and just, you know, the stress associated with, uh, running a legal business is, uh, on a different level than, uh, anything legacy. How has, um, HPLV affected, uh, anything that you're doing? Currently? Uh, you know, knock on wood, uh, n no effects so far, but, um, um, you know, we, uh, we, we've done a lot of our, uh, own pheno hunting, um, you know, we try to, to, we try to, you know, do a lot of our stuff from seed just so that, uh, we're able to find out which genetics are really working in our facility, in our environment, you know, for the That's practices that, uh, we're, we're implementing. So, and the genetics that fit your grow, dude, like that's something a lot of people don't understand is, you know, like you hear about the hype strains and you want them and for sure you're going to make it work. And it's not always how it goes, you know, so you have to find ones that fit your grow fit your environment sure. or that you can morph just a little bit to grow with the strain. But at a certain point, you know, you're, you're, it's just fighting to try to make something fit. And if it doesn't fit, you must not acquit. You know what I mean? For sure. I mean, all yeah. we're doing right now is just kind of, you know, genetically throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks, you know, it's like, uh, it, we, we got to understand, you know, not only what is going to work in our facility, but what is there a market for as well, which yeah, isn't always uh, easy to t determine. So what, what kind of stuff do you find right now? What kind of stuff are you interested in right now in your facility that seems to be working for what you're doing? Um, well, I mean, we just did a, uh, a seed run of uh, candy fumes, which uh, I'm pretty excited about. I mean, we're still waiting for testing to come back on that, but... We've got several phenos that look pretty promising. Um, this next run, we're going to be putting in some. Uh, uh, we've got three different phenos of lemon maraschino from Swamp Boys that yeah. uh, we're going to be committing a little bit more space to. Um, and uh, yeah, that's good to hear. I mean, like, I but anytime you hear some of these old dudes like Swamp Boys getting some respect, I, I like to hear that and making their way into the the modern market. You know. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's been uh, um, a notorious good pheno selector too over the years. Whenever he pops some beans, he usually finds some pretty good. So I need to send Oki some shit too. For I sure. wouldn't leave him off the list. Yeah, <laughs> man. No, yeah. If you if you're wanting to run through some insane blue terps, I got you, bro. Love blueberry. Yeah, me too. I'm a blueberry fiend, and it's, I've made it my mission to make the best blueberry possible on Earth. So totally. yeah, I, think, I think we're there, so I'm stoked. How about you, Chris? Tell us about some of your journey now and what you're doing now. Yeah. Um, it was up until like 2016, 2017. I was still in the you know legacy gray market, whatever you want to call it. because It's a different name every year, traditional market. Traditional, um, yeah. You know, and uh, a buddy of mine who's, who's also from the forums and, you know, around older cat kind of got me into consulting and uh, was always into uh, a lot of the nutritive side of cannabis. Um, mm -hmm. Had been, you know, been making my own custom nude formulas, you know, dry salts and uh, eventually kind of did a lot of stuff with soil, soil analysis, really throwing some science at soil techniques rather than just, you know, just guessing. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, I was lucky through, through consulting that, you know, I got to step into some pretty big facilities and start to learn, you know, kind of how to talk to talk with those people and, and, and gain some business acumen and, and, um, you know, uh, 
soon after that, like 2019, 2020, uh, really up until last year, uh, that whole period that, that, you know, four or five years, um, I spent in various just director roles around the country, um, at, at larger commercial facilities. Um, you know, nothing really stuck, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> and, and, and a lot of places, you know, I was just grinding myself to the bone. Um, and it was either like, you know, it just wasn't a fit as far as the chemistry with the owners, or they were just like, I came in as their like fifth grower and the place was a mess. Oh yeah. And I, I you can only fix it so much because they're broke or they're going through a lawsuit or, you know what I mean? It's just That's like the hardest that, position to be put in. It is. Um, and, uh, you know, and I met some good people in that world as well. And, you know, kind of learned how to manage people a little bit better and uh, manage my time, manage, you know, uh, tasks and software and, and, and uh, you know, just do other things that you didn't really do as a grower. Yeah. So, um, but always kind of going back to the nutritive side, always like focused on um, efficiencies, you know, both Oki and I are both engineers, but, you know, academically. So it's like, you're always thinking efficiencies and, and, um, you know, hopefully not to sacrifice quality, but just asking sure. like the, the hows and the whys of, of a lot of the things you're doing and, um, you know, and, and taking that approach. And so right now I'm working with Fort Row Coco, um, which has actually been great to be in something ancillary, not running one of these facilities myself. What's it? What's and, it called? Uh, Fort Grove. Fort Grove Coco? Yeah, they're, they're based in uh, Santa Cruz, Watsonville um and you know small company i'm I'm employee number two on the on the u.s side i'm basically awesome, doing all the, the the product business development for the cannabis side of it and working with a lot of growers um back in 2019 uh, i was running a big place up in washington and we were burning through a couple different brands of cocoa and we're, you know oh, that's yeah. when like cocoa i feel like cocoa was really blowing up at that time everybody wanted to grow in cocoa it was like hype or legalization was spreading everybody's building these mega facilities and uh and there was a lot of just fly-by-night cocoa brands that were salty mm. or had root aphids or whatever <laughs> yes, um yes. so you, you know so we all went through it and uh and that's you know i started applying different like lab analysis and different things to, to cocoa and um i always just went back to pork row it's like this is actually a really good product small company I could text the CEO. He'll make something special for me if I want and just circle back to them. And, you know, started just like working with them at MJ biz and some of the conferences, just to interface for growers and, you know, be someone knowledgeable for them. And, uh, yeah, just January this year, they asked me to come on full time with them and, and yeah, it's been a total pleasure. It's been, you That's know, awesome. it's funny That's that awesome. my, my social media has like grown way more in the, in the cannabis cultivation community like working for them than it did as like a trap guy with like, even with like all the breeder connections and everything I sure, have, like none of that matters, you know? So yeah, so it's, it's, it's been a blessing. I'm grateful for it. Yeah, dude, I'm a cocoa fiend and, and we need to talk. Hell yeah. Yeah. I'll get, I'll get you some samples. I'll hook you up. Like yeah. That. We also got the cabana code for anybody uh, on the cabana. You can, Go check out the Hort Grow Forum over there. Chris will answer any questions you got. You can get a <laughs> coupon code. So if you order up some Hort Grow, you get 15% off. Yeah, dude, we'll do the same. If, if you want, we could do the same with Breeder Syndicate, too, and fucking push some people your way. Because a, a lot of people like to grow like I grow, and I'm a cocoa fiend, bro. Cocoa fiend. Yeah. A purist. Yeah. And I can 100% vouch for Hort Grow. Uh Chris and I were actually working in a facility out here in Oklahoma together last year or the year before. I can't time flies. Two, two years uh, ago now, yeah. Yeah, two years ago now. And we ran the whole thing on uh, one gallon expandable cocoa pots from Hort Grow. And yeah. they were awesome. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's what, what we're using thing? right now. Oh, what's that? Uh, that's what we're running in our facility right now as well. The Hort Grow one gallon open tops. That sounds fucking awesome too. So, what yeah, kind of strains are you working with right now? What, what, what's your newest shtick over there that you're running? Um, I've got a uh, a pheno of uh, Triangle Clean from um, 
um, relentless uh, genetics. That's really nice. Really, uh, really uh, triangle dominant pheno that just has like a little bit of cherry uh, on it. Nice. And, uh, we really like that one. Um, it's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's taking a while for the market to uh, discover it just because it's not like, you know, bright purple. Yeah, uh, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of people are discovering it, and I think it's going to be one that we kind of become known for. Um, and we're going to bring green weed back in for sure, man. Yeah, yeah, man, it's needed. Yeah. But no, like relentless. I like that's one of the few dudes that came in after I did, and like I I really did a bad job of like keeping track because so many people came in. Like you know, when I first started, there was maybe fifty people doing it big worldwide, like selling seeds in mass. Yeah. And now there's, you know, 10,000 seed companies via Instagram. And Relentless was one of the few that I, I actually respect the dude quite a bit. Real super nice dude. And I, I appreciate what he's doing. And he's doing good work. Really All good. of his uh, rotten crosses, if you come across his rotten cherries or yeah, yeah. Um, rotten bananas or anything, all of his rotten crosses that I've seen, fire. Fire, right? Yeah, yeah I've heard a lot of good shit about his work, so. He's one person I want to collab with in the future just because I, I, I like uh I like seeing the, the next generation take it to a new level and he's one of the people doing it. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about some of the cabana stuff and where what kind of stuff are you gonna be implementing? How is it gonna change from where it was? Uh when I, you know, was on it for a while and then off and then on and then off and then on. And how is it gonna go into the future? Most important thing for everyone to take in is that we are open to the public now. So you yeah. can go register right now, um, set up an account, and you'll have full access to everything. There's no uh, tiered memberships. You won't have to pay for anything. Everything is completely free to the community. And a lot of old school knowledge on there. I'm trying hard right. to get the new generation to come over and check us out and i think they'll find you know some educational things and some information that uh you know it makes worth uh checking out the cabana on a regular basis the link scrolling across the bottom of the screen for anybody watching so you know should be no question where you're headed to the other things that we're doing is uh pretty much all the rules and old restrictions that were once there um are gone so yeah. if you are a breeder and you are making seeds like man come tell us about these seeds come post them up come trade seeds with me because i might offer you i might want i might want some of those beans you yeah know? you got some so, good shit in your fucking vault so yeah, yeah so I, I want everybody to know that uh it's a seed friendly community man you can Sell some beans. You've got people hitting you up in the DMs. Want some beans? By all means, man. I, I, I want everybody to uh, be able to utilize the cabana as a tool and uh, make it a valuable asset for them, man. And Absolutely. the great thing about the cabana, probably more, maybe not just in just sheer numbers because places like IC Mag and some of these people have like so many registered members because they've been open for 20 years. Yeah, but uh, we have so many breeders on the cabana, and Quantity. people who have just been making beans in their closet for twenty years and have uh, a seed arsenal that would, you know, make most of us sweat if we looked at yeah, it. Dude. You know, and uh, so I'm gonna make it so those those seeds are gonna be available to people. I want to give the small guys a way to um get their beans out into the community and um so we're gonna work on that we're gonna have a store coming um I'm stoked man we got uh lots of breeders already involved and the breeders that uh it's gonna be easy to get more involvement from these breeders as we get more involvement from the community you know yeah. so some people are like, oh, they're not on there that much. Well, they will be if, you know, if there was a reason for them to be there, they'll come, you know. Nobody's up on there just because I picked a company that I thought was cool. No, I talked to everybody. Everybody's 
down with the mission and it's just a matter of getting our traffic up and uh you know getting the vibe back to where it kind of used to be and how we get there and how we do that i'm still working on it we're throwing uh lots of ideas out and so if anybody's got ideas or you got an idea that you think like oh this would be dope if the forums did it like this i want to hear them you know what i mean let yeah. me know so like i want this forum to be for us for the people who appreciate the forum like let's make it so you know it's the best forum it can be for us you know, you know uh, for uh 420 i don't know if you guys are down for it but me and csi both uh worked on some diesel fans and uh my new blueberry shit let's give some away dude let's do a little contest something let's do it bumping, actually dude. inspector just sent me a bunch of gear and uh, there were some diesel crosses in there man yeah so, that's part of it uh, dude i'm gonna that's get there stuff. Yeah, dude, and uh let's idea. see other things um you know with the cabana being open to the public it it gives everybody a chance to come check it out and everybody can register and be a part of it but i really like that even doing that and we've added over a thousand members and stuff since we you know been open yeah. for three months now um it still maintains like the old kind of cabana vibe everybody's being super respectful uh, you know we don't really have any trolls um yeah. if we did like i don't really have you know tolerance super high tolerance for yeah. internet no dumb shit that, like, i'll just you know? you just delete it and move on yeah There's not gonna be a big argument or scene about it and uh that's what we've been trying to do. And everybody, uh, everybody's like it every day. Um, hearing from new people that, you know, going to come back and check it out. Like, you know, last week I was having breakfast with Katsu and, um, he, you know, he's like, uh, he's got his own forum and he's got his own store. And that's the other thing. Everybody's got their own discords. Everybody's got yeah, Instagram. Yeah. Everybody's got Facebook. Everybody's got, half a dozen social media profiles that they have to maintain and so yeah. we're just fighting for our space and we have to prove our value to um get everybody to come but uh the old school people like we we got them and i think there's going to be a new appreciation for the old school and what they had and what they had to offer because i think these exotics are kind of running their course right now everybody yeah, everybody uh is kind of i'm hearing gas and cam and diesel and it everything that i like back, you know? everything it that i like kind of making a resurgence yeah yeah you know and uh even I, haze I, yeah even haze bro even, even haze, haze. i don't yeah. want any haze but bring it back to somebody <laughs> who does that yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, Phil, Phil Rojo had some killer haze crosses. I mean, this man had some killer shit. He probably still does. Let's get him Let on me here. send Phil this link, man. Let's get him in here. Yeah, let's get Phil on here because this is the man that was in National Geographic. He was one of the, you know what? Honestly, he was one of the main reasons I went out to Colorado when I did. I really wanted to meet this dude um, who had done so much and made such an impact during those years in Colorado when he was really thriving. And I knew he was going big places. And, I, and like, when, I'm one of those guys where I really believe like attracts like. And if you want to be successful, surround yourself with people who think successful and are optimistic and taking themselves forward. And he was one of them, you know? And he always shared his time with me, very respectful. Um, I have a lot of respect for that dude. Lots. Yeah, that's cool. Phil is awesome. And I don't know. I honestly, I can't even remember how I met Phil. It was through through the forum somehow. But when I met him, uh, he was he had a big warehouse over off of I seventy in Denver, and I'd go over there and I used to buy seed. I was buying seeds like, oh yeah, dude, notorious you know. for it. Yeah, I, I I was buying seeds nonstop. Yeah, B H O money, bro. <laughs> It was coming from somewhere, and uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, Boy, I just want to interject. 
Curb oh, used no. to give me crap when I wouldn't spend like at least six k a month on seeds. You're like, That's bro, what are you great. doing with your life right now? And I'm like, well, wasting your money on, shit. on seeds like that. But go ahead, continue. Uh, no one can ever say I haven't put my money where my mouth is when it comes That's to seeds. That's for damn sure. <laughs> yeah. But I would buy seeds just to give them to Rojo and yeah, just yeah. so he could pop them. Do and those everything. big pops. And, uh, you know, he would let me store moms over there. And, you know, there's been there, there's been some people who, you know, I don't really want to throw anyone under the bus, but uh, there's been people who have stolen a lot of genetics out of that facility that have gone on to start companies. Oh, sure. And yep. uh, all of that. Um, he's a piece of shit. We can are. go ahead and say it. Colin, ethos, uh, genetics. Yeah, yeah. Be, e egos? Egos? I think you... Maybe ethos. Oh, egos. Egos genetics. Yeah. Yeah. So he, uh, you know... He, he worked over there for a while and he got some stuff. Then he ended up working over at my other buddy's uh, facility, New Age Medical, and yeah, got a ton of my stuff. And boom, Ethos Seed Collection was formed not long afterwards. Yeah, he's not well liked, bro. But, but Phil was always awesome because he he was the first person that I think he really recognized in me at least that. Like I was about that seed life. Like, yeah, dude. Yeah. And one year for my birthday, he came over to my house and he popped up with a Ziploc bag full of beans. And they were all Tom Hill Hayes crosses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um Bubba Tom Hayes, bro. Yeah, Bubba Tom Hayes, Skunk Valley Hayes. Um God, he had so many fucking Blockhead words. Hayes. So, so many things in there. And uh I gave him away for years. He told me he was like, "Man, just you know, anybody." Oh, I got wants, it from you. Anybody who wants these, just you know, get, get them in their hands. And I did that for years. I would do auctions to you know help raise money for various people on Instagram. Boom, I'm sending them ten, twenty seeds, you yeah, know, yeah. or ten, twenty packs of seeds. Not, yeah. Um, one year for the cup, I gave. Uh, I did these breeder bags and. It was like 60 bag, sixty packs of seeds in them. I collected, I had a bunch of beans that Obsolete had set on a bunch of beans for me. Yep. Um, Got I, had a, I had a bunch of stuff from La Plata Labs. Yeah, um, he's a great dude too. Yeah, you know Joey? Yeah, yeah, he's great Yeah, he, he's great awesome. Dude. He's actually uh, Sweetheart. not far from me in Oklahoma out here right now. Can you tell him I said what's up, dude? Like, he's always been really fucking cool. I like I that. I will, guy. and... Man, he's one of those dudes who I think is also super slept on because yes, he was making beans and packaging up beans and kind of grinding on the underground stateside scene like before most people were, man. Yeah. And uh, he had, he's got some great stuff, man. Yeah. He had a Durango OG, I think it was called. It was really yeah. good. Fire. Fire OG. Yeah. Had some white voodoo and some big white. And yeah, some, dude lemon aliens and he he had some good stuff back in the day yeah lots of respect for that dude yeah he was the, for a while he started getting really big but i think he just kind of backed off a little bit from the scene and uh slowed down but yeah the respect's still there definitely for him from uh people you know. i think he started doing uh some hemp stuff and i know he was doing some stuff uh um internationally as well so oh, good he stays busy, man. Uh, I, he posted up some picture. He's one of those guys who can go away and you don't hear from him or see anything from him for like three or four years. And then he posts up some picture of like some mega greenhouse that's going yeah, you know, for 400 yards full of fucking uh, can of More than from. my ass. That's for fucking sure. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so he always stays with a project. He's a worker. Yeah, dude. That's cool. That's really cool. But. Yeah, so Phil would give me tons of stuff. When I went to the Lion, um, Phil also hooked me up with uh, a guy named Mike Finelli, and uh, he does a ton of uh, um, like grow design. He'll, he'll get your okay. room all set up. He was working with, uh, oh man, kick myself. He, uh, these old controllers. What were the old controllers called? 
before the troll masters everybody had one yeah, of these yeah. i can't remember what it was called but uh he helped design those and then he worked with a guy named Bo who owned chlorophyll up here in Denver. Which okay. is just like a nutrient, you know, just a little uh hydro shop. And he plugged me up with so many people that um just because I knew Phil took extra good care of me. You yeah. Know? So I was getting the plug on nutrients. I was I got the plug on the room design and the build out and stuff. I mean, these guys came down and they moved into the warehouse with me down yeah. in Colorado Springs. And we're like, they're missing out 24, you know, around the clock. So they grind. And yeah, uh, th that just comes from his kind of his work mentality. Yeah, dude. Know? I, I really think if you would have stuck with the black market scene, at least he would have been a uh, much more on the CSI level in respect. You know what I mean? um but dipping away you know a lot of people don't remember him as well and i think his name deserves more respect and should be back out there you know he's one of those guys too who's always doing a breeding project and exactly probably got like <laughs> walk-in freezers full of gear i know and, i need uh, to see that i need to get up in there i need to get my hands on it <laughs> I need yeah, to man it. i've already been asking him i was like hey remember when you gave me all those beans you should do something like that again so I yeah. can get them out. <laughs> right right so um but man phil is awesome he's probably one of my biggest uh i mean he's like somebody i actually looked up to in the weed like a mentor of sort. yeah you know yeah, he, he always did it uh big and as i started getting into managing co commercial facilities and um bigger projects and stuff like that you realize like the undertaking that they actually are massive you know what i mean yeah. everybody everybody can grow good weed but can you, can you grow scale? can you do it at scale and growing it at scale is uh just bigger challenges bigger risks bigger losses you know what i mean yeah. something goes yeah. wrong and uh your four lighter it's a lot easier to recover from you know a 40 light room you yeah, know absolutely. with an issue that's so, why you're looking at a bunch of bald guys right now yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> right so yeah and i don't think i probably would have had the confidence to do uh um these bigger facilities if i hadn't been able to spend the time asking questions and seeing Rojo's facilities and how the things that he was doing to um, just make everything run smooth and just yeah. a well-oiled machine. And that's what you got to have on a commercial level, you know? So I kind of got a question for you, Kirby. When What's we first it? met, you were curbside extracts, right? I was... Can you talk about some of that shit? <laughs> Are you feel comfortable talking with, about any of that? I've always been curbside service ever yeah. since like middle school. And <laughs> then uh and then I was curbside concentrates. I was yeah. always I've always curbside service. Like my little brother gives me shit because I just do everything under a flag of curbside. Yeah. So I've always you known know. you as Kirby, yeah. Yeah. So uh um, like um you were the dude. I did uh, back in the day. I got I everyone started my boy brought a five gallon bucket back from California and it had like honey oil in it, like BHO honey oil. We're talking a Home Depot five gallon bucket. Jesus I'd never Christ. seen anything like it. And I was yeah. just like and nor had I smoked anything like it at the time either. Yeah. And I was just like, man. This is from BHO. This is like I started doing all this research and on the cabana, there's a guy, OG legend. His name is Gray Wolf. And oh, yeah, yeah. If you've ever done any form of BHO extract, you know, I'm sure you've ran across some something that led you to Gray Wolf at some point. Yeah. But he put me on game to this place back in the day called Glacier Tanks. And I want to say they were up in Oregon or Washington or somewhere northeast and i started buying all these stainless steel tubes 
and uh, my, my dad uh, owns a welding company and has got a machine shop and stuff. And so, like, when I had an idea, it was easy for me to execute. Like, oh, yeah, let's try this. Right. Let, let's do that. And uh, I would get these stainless steel tubes, and I had like fifty of them, and three feet by an inch and a half. And you could pack them with a half pound of weed. Mm -hmm. And um, I started ordering um, Entain. And I was in Colorado. I'm pretty sure I was the first person you had that, that license, right? Get that license. wanted Entain. Because when I was asking General Air, which is like the biggest gas supplier out yeah. in Denver, across the country, it's like, man, I need some butane. And they were just, for what? What what could you possibly need, you know, a bottle of butane, for? butane for? Yeah. And uh they had to do some research to even find it to see if they could get it. And they ended up getting it from Texas. And I'd have to give them heads up um when I need it. And then I started just telling them, I was like, here's your heads up. Like, I need yeah. it. Like yeah. just keep shipping it up here and like have me on a rotation. And so I had I had quick connects and I just boom turn my bottle of butane on, blast through a tube, fill it into a one gallon glass pitcher, pour it into a pie pan, and for a long time, I don't want to say a long time for a short time, I was getting more money doing. 50 50 splits with people than I was like yeah. on a regular crop. Someone would give me their crop and I was able to pay them more for their crop off of their 50%. Sure. Then they could even get selling a hundred percent of it in flour. There was so damn much need for it at the time that market. was massive. And it was, there's not a lot of markets that I've hit at the right time where it's like, I got in yeah. like right at the right time. That was yeah, the right did. time. I wasn't one of, I was early. Uh, so not a lot of people had volume like I had. Somebody yeah, might've no, had access and you know, all of it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, to this day, to this day, one of my best friends, who's, you know, he was out in Oakland, he was up on the Hill, you know, 15 years ago. And, and he, he went out to one of Kirby's, barbecues in aurora and when when curve had first built like the first closed loop and he was like bro even to this day like my, my buddy and callie will be like your, your boy kirby was like ahead of the curve ahead of everybody yeah, on the closed loop tech yeah that's that's the one thing i i think you're pretty legendary for in my mind like when i think of kirby i think of all those like vac trays all that shit just never seen anybody do it so big at once the the closed loop tech too came from the forums yeah and it all started i can't i can't remember who did it or the name of the what even forum it was on but it was a uh some pressurized paint cans that uh i did my first closed loop out of man out of some so harbor wild, freight man. pressurized paint cans and yeah so I've, I've done it every single way possible uh good ways and bad ways so yes, uh, yeah i did the bad ways early on the open blasting and the fucking yeah. and then it got to a point where it just the science of it all outgrew me and these yeah. new guys with some of their closed loop techs and um the things that they're doing to clean up the fats and the lipids and all, you know, all the things, uh, it's amazing, man. And, um, one of my boys, I went the other way to rosin. So. Yeah. Right. Then I went to rosin, man. Freeze dried and rosin, bro. That, that, that's another Phil story. Another Rojo story is, uh, I was going out, I was going to his warehouse and, um, uh, kind bill, uh, yeah. was working there doing the extracts and um, they were telling me about this new thing that they had done, man. They're like, oh man, we, we've invented live resin and um, it's, uh, it's so good and the turp profiles are this and it's just like th they started showing it to me and they were like telling me how to do it and I was like, oh, all you got to do is freeze it and then just... Yeah, yeah. 
do it do it the same way you just gotta freeze it beforehand like yeah i was like well fuck bro i can do that and uh so they were telling me they're like yeah you gotta you gotta get a cryo freezer and they're this expensive i'm like oh shit but they didn't even have the cryo freezer at the time like yeah. they were just telling me like they're gonna get it i wasn't even i don't think i'd even started my car up from the parking lot before I had ordered a cryo freezer used <laughs> off of eBay. <laughs> and uh, so for 500 bucks off eBay, man, I had a used cryo freezer shipped up here and um, I started doing live resin and uh, I taught my boy, Lord Rude Boy, how to blast and process material uh, when we were at the Lion. and. He's one of those guys where it's just like when the student becomes the master because yeah. he just took it to a whole nother level and uh, he can do it all, dissolute, rosin. You know, he's he's a hash master. Can you, real quick, explain for me the definition of live resin? It's something I've never been able, because I know you were at the base of it. What is the true definition of live resin as it was originally meant to be live resin? I mean, to me, it's just the preservation of the freshest terps possible by freezing it as quickly as possible when you cut it down and i always uh, i always assumed like they were taking the live plant still in the pot like smashing it that way and that's the only way i had no clue what it meant you know? well that's why you want the cryo freezer because it gets yeah. colder faster so you can cut your plant down and there's less wilting and things like yeah. that uh in the freezing process how much of a difference does it make? Um, it does make a difference because you get less condensation and you get less water buildup. Uh, um, but do the resins mature before you do that? Nah, not if you're like literally cutting it down, putting yeah. it in a bag, getting it in and the does freezer. Does that make a difference to some degree? It's literally how fast you can do it. You don't want to cut it down, let your plant sit outside for an hour, two hours before it yeah. gets bagged up and put it in the freezer. It's like, you want to chop it, get it in the bag, get it in the freezer, get it frozen. And, uh, that sounds like the, a forum argument already though. You know, someone yeah, right? like, nah, bro, my shit's so dank. It doesn't matter. I'll leave yeah, it right? out for a day and it'll still make better hash than your shit. Well, like I think about it, like with blueberry, like a lot of the blueberries need to cure for a month before they get their blueberry terps back in full form. I'm just wondering how different that would be. How different that would be with live resin, and, and if it would be worth it to do it. That well, way. man, it. I think it's totally worth it to compare the differences between a live resin terp and a well cured terp. Um, yeah, because they're gonna be totally different. You know, if you're harvesting a plant on harvest day when you're cutting it down it smells different than when it's smoke day after it's cured. Absolutely. For sure. that. And the same principle with live resin. Like you're cutting it down with that terp profile that you're preserving at that moment in time. And, there was stuff uh, like strawberry cream though, that smelled like strawberry straight off the bush, bro. That would be perfect for live resin. Yeah. Oh man. And fly. I had, uh, Obsolete had sent me a bunch of his orange crosses when he had first orange made juice them. bud. Or, yeah. yeah, the orange juice bud, and I had you know the orange juice bud times sour dud times ghost OG times um GSC to yeah, I can't even remember all of them, but that's what we were doing the the dab bar down in Colorado Springs uh, at the lazy lion. And yeah, that's kind of like what made us famous, man, was these live resin orange terps that we had down there because like people were kind of just getting into dabs and they would take a dab of, you know, some regular dab and be coughing and like, oh, sure. it was almost a painful experience, man. But then right? like yeah. when people started like, you know, Terps started coming through on dabs and you know the live resin and all of that like it changed how people were smoking it man it yeah, especially it with became, the orange juice uh, but that shit's citrus as fuck from the jump uh, yeah, undeniable flavor more. it's one of those uh you know obsolete just posted up on instagram that his uh, orange apricot got voted like best terps 
and yeah, they're still doing time. like the legend orange apricot stuff, like uh, yeah. Japan. Yeah, yeah, and uh, those turps definitely need to be preserved for sure. But unfortunately, those original crosses, and I know Ob still has a few packs of the originals. I tried to get them off of him, man, and uh, he's holding Kick him them down, Obs. <laughs> no, nah, he needs to hold on to him. He needs to do something with him. But yeah. uh, those Terps, man, out of that batch, those were probably some of the best Terps that's come out of a, of a public seed release. And I don't even know like how public those were. I don't know if he really sold them or if he just kind of gave Alien them. Alien Orange Cookies people, was like, out there a bunch. But yeah. yeah. But... Uh, Man, probably some of the best turps to hit the market in a, a noticeable while. Yeah, yeah, they were good, man. They were real good orange. I just wanted to take a quick moment and thank everyone for showing up. Again, Kirby and all the homies from, from the cabana. Um, they're always amazing episodes. These guys are real passionate, true seed collectors. And what they're doing at the cabana, we're really supportive of. Again, decanacabana.com is where you go to sign up. Um, you can also go to riotseeds.com, again, to pick up our blueberry and cross stuff. There's there's multiple hybrids of the blueberry and cross. Also, for 420, which we're going to announce on 418, we got the High and Lonesome's new Mango Haze drop. And we finally have Matt Elite's uh, different Chem D I-95 hybrids. I am so stoked. Been working on it for years. They are in my opinion, the best Chem 91 regular seeds where you can reliably pick out like amplified Chem 91 terps along with a bunch of really true breeding, true OG Kush seed lines and regular lines. So you can make your own OG Kush seed lines with the males from this stuff. Um, Matt Elite stuff is above and beyond. It's why I've hounded him for years. There's only going to be a few packs available of each. He wants to he doesn't think there's going to be a lot of interest because he's missed the seed market the last, I don't know, four or five years. I know you'll love it. So please go check that out at riotseeds.com. We also have Riot Seeds Seed Co. Europe. We have Girt by Seeds in Australia. And then, of course, Lifted Seeds in California. Um, takes credit card processing. Great guy. Carries Can Illuminati members. Couldn't recommend him highly enough. Um, we're going to try to get the Blueberry in cross out to Australia, um, possibly Europe, depending on you know how everything works out. Maybe Brazil. The Brazil drop is coming very soon, very, very soon. We're going to have a bunch of our FEM stuff over there. And uh, yeah, don't forget, we have the Jesel FEM stuff on the site. There's multiple different Jesel crosses, some of the skunkiest stuff you're going to find. Um, we also have stuff from SubRob under Seed Trip in the FEM section. We have his Skank Dog and the SSSDH, which is his 98 Super Silver Haze Cross 2 Sour Dub. Sour Dub is a dank fucking clone. If you miss it, you miss it. It's all there is. Again, I always say this. I can't reiterate it enough. When things sell out, people will ask me where it's at. They finally get into it with their Johnny Come Lately's and it's gone. You have to go to other people's seed collections and pay a premium. So go get it now. And if you're a member of our Patreon, you get an automatic 30% off on all the Blueberry in cross stuff that I'm doing. And uh, yeah, we also have um, Goat Farm's new drop with some of his Blue Dream crosses, which are also available for 30% off if you're a part of our Patreon. So please go check that out. Join our Patreon. Um, this weekend's UFC 300, and we're all watching it. So be there or be square. And with that, thanks for coming to the show. Thanks for watching it. The Cabana is really important to me. It's important to CSI. We want everyone to be a part of it. We want everyone to use it. And, uh, yeah, we plan on it being our sister website and, and accomplishing the goals that we have set. Um, we can only do this as a community, and it's a great community there. With that, lots of love, and we'll see you next week for part two. Want to sit at the table with the syndicate? Check out our Patreon in our link tree or description below. Our merch site is officially live. We have all sorts of shirts, hoodies, and goodies to sort you out, and shipping is super fast, and most importantly, the quality is top-notch. I've been saving old designs for years for this purpose, so please check it out, syndicategear.com. 
We also have an underground syndicate discord where we get together and solve old strain history together daily. It's an amazing community of learning away from IG and it's an amazing resource for old catalogs and knowledge. We hope you join our union of breeders and growers. Come check it out.